Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Amin Dillon, and today's episode is dedicated to mortgages. Regardless if this is your first home, an upgrade home, vacation home, income property, whatever it is, most likely you're going to need a mortgage. Now to answer some of your most commonly asked questions, I've got mortgage agent and expert Ray Diaz on the episode today who's going to be breaking it all down about mortgages. Here is my exclusive chat with him. All right, Ray, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking time out. First of all, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm in. I'm good. Now the spring weather is here, so I feel like spring Love weather it. means it's going to be all good times from now on, right? That's 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 what it's about, right? That's what it's supposed to be. I thought that's what you told me that it's going to be. I think so. But I know for the real estate market, uh, it's not going to be slowing down. It's just going to get hotter and hotter. So that's why we've got you on the show today, because we've been talking to so many experts about the real estate market. Is it going to crash? What are the best places to invest in, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't talk about real estate without talking about money. So that's where you come in as a mortgage agent. I'm sure right now life is very interesting for you. We are going to go through some of the most commonly quest, uh, asked questions and you are going to give us the expert answer. So we know uh, what to expect when people are looking to either buy their first home or to upgrade. Sound good? Sounds good. Shoot. Okay. So first question, why does someone need a mortgage pre-approval? Mortgage pre-approval is, is a scenario where if you're a buyer and you're going around shopping around for a home, having a mortgage pre approval gives you an idea that you can actually get financing or that purchase price that you're going in is actually something that you can afford. Imagine going into a home that's worth a million dollars and you fall in love with it. And then you go see the bank and you go, well, I'm in a uh, million dollar home. Definitely is very nice, very beautiful, but you can only afford $900,000. 900,000 is still a good number, but, there's a reason why it's $100,000 less. So it sets yourself up for, for disappointment when you, you know, go and shop and you don't know whether or not you can afford it. Now, when I say you can afford it, obviously it means that we've gone through the process of saying, hey, I'm in, how much is your income? You know, what kind of debts do you have? So that's the liability part. You know, what kind of assets? So down payment sources you have access to. And then lastly, once we figure out how much you can afford, how good is your credit? And then tell me about the properties that you're interested in. So on a mortgage pre-approval, we look at your ability to pay your financial responsibilities. And then we look at your credit history that says, hey, you're, you're likely to, to pay your financial responsibility. So we qualify your documentation up front so that when you go shop for the right price that you know you already get, you got a qualified for, the only missing piece is the property. So the pre-approval sets you up to put in an offer that you know you can qualify and get approved for. And then obviously the last thing the lender just has to qualify is, is the, the house, the townhouse, the condo that you bought. So just to clarify for anyone who is buying a property for the first time, when you go in with your pre-approval, that means yes, for sure you are able to get that amount. So there's no chance that they'll get that mortgage pre-approval, go out there, put a firm offer in somewhere you know, no conditions because they already have that letter. They know they're approved for that 900,000, let's just say. And then when they go to close the deal, you're not going to come back to them and say, oh, you know what? You know, it's been a week or two. The bank has changed its mind. You're only approved for like 800,000, right? There's no chance. So there is a chance because the question mark is the property. Yeah. So when we see purchase uh, agreements with without any condition of financing or with you know, basically clean offer, as you mentioned, technically you're, you're the buyer as a buyer, you're still taking a chance that that property that you bought for 900,000 that was originally listed for 800,000. So it's a hundred thousand dollar over asking. You're taking a chance that that $900,000 property that you bought can appraise for 900,000. So there is still that question mark. So lender can qualify you on the pre-approval in terms of, again, your ability to borrow, right? As a covenant, but not necessarily the security, the property yet, because once you have the property, now it's a mortgage approval, not a mortgage pre-approval. So there is, there's a chat. So uh, there's a level of risk that, you know, when you buy something without any condition of financing, but that's where you go and, and make your own call as a buyer to say, if I bought it for $900,000, do I have comparables? Can I justify that amount? 
Ray, are you at all concerned? Because um, we know with the market right now, uh, places are overbidding, overselling like never before, right? It's like some places are appreciating like 30%. Um, and within a year, places that we've never even really been to. Um, are you or your um, clients concerned that once things reopen, let's say somebody got, I don't know, like a pre-construction or let's say they did buy something and they go in for the appraisal, let's say all of a sudden the market corrects. And now that, you know, 900,000 home in little town, Ontario, um, isn't being appraised for that. It's actually going for lower. What happens in that scenario? So, it, it, so yeah, the answer is yes, only because um, for the longer closings that you mentioned, the market can turn from the time that you buy to the time that, that, that the property closes. There's also a scenario where, you know, every single home that's being bought today is the highest sold price on the street. It's great for marketing if you're a realtor and listing agent and stuff because you're able to get as much money as you can for, for your client. But on the buying side, um, it obviously is a little bit of a concern because if it's $100,000 over asking, $200,000 over asking, would the financial company be able to justify that amount? Now, there's a scenario where you can overpay by a little bit and you still be able to, you're still be able to withstand the that increase. So if you're putting 50% down them in on the, on the purchase, and there's $10,000 difference between 900 to an appraisal amount of $890,000, I may be able to to make some adjustments and go work with the lender and say, hey, let's adjust the loan to value and I mean can still get the money that she's looking for. Um, but when you're looking at new build properties where the closing is a year, two years down the line, there could be a different market. Now, one of the things that we do with our team is to make sure that when we see a resale purchase, that we order the appraisal right away. Because you, if you're familiar with you know, what's happened in the past or could happen, is that if you buy today, we get you approved, and then we wait until a month or two months after to order the appraisal. A month from now, if the market turns, now if it goes up, everybody's happy. But if that price goes down, down, you might be exposed or we might be exposing the clients to, to uh, more down payment requirement. Okay. They may or may not have it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what are you, I don't know if you're getting clients talking about this, but we know um, depending on what type of property people are buying, uh, like if they're buying a home, I think people are banking on it's going to just keep appreciating. Uh, however, the condo market has surprisingly taken a hit everywhere. So for people that bought pre-construction, uh, they might have got their mortgage approval when they signed the contract. So maybe it's a year, year and a half. Uh, let's say those projects are not coming up for close this year or maybe uh, early next year. Um, and now the condo market has obviously taken a hit. So what happens then in that situation? We, so we haven't seen that significant decrease yet. We've seen the January and February numbers for Toronto condos have actually recovered quite a bit. Now, uh, if it's a hypothetical, a uh, hypothetical scenario where, you know, your particular purchase may have a decreased um, valuation, um, like I said earlier, it might be a scenario where we have to go back to the client and say, I mean, you need to come up with another 5% or 10% because if we want to purchase this as your primary residence or, or a rental property, you need to be able to afford that borrowing that you're, you're, uh, you're borrowing for. And part of what we look at is the value of the property, right? So if you bought it for a you know, condo for $700,000 and now it's worth $600,000, it's a $100,000 difference. Obviously, you may want to, you know, at the worst case scenario, you may want to expect to put another $100,000 as additional down payment. Now, that's a worst case scenario. Um, we haven't seen it though in reality, only because condos are typically, you know, three year to four year closes. So if you if we're in 2021, you probably have bought this in 2017, let's say, uh, maybe 2016. So because of the period of time, it still has increased. So we haven't seen such a drastic decrease in price or, uh, or it hasn't reflected current market as far as new condos are closing today. Now, 2022, you said, I, if, if there is an adjustment, we, we just have to deal with it from a, either a higher, de higher uh, down payment uh, scenario or may even be graduating you or putting you down to a, maybe a, a B lender instead of an A lender. Okay, but for anyone that's concerned about that, 
if they go to you, you will be able to help them get the financing, right? They're not going to be in a situation where there's nothing they can do and they won't get approved. There's all, yeah, there's, there's different levels of financing that's in, that's involved. And obviously the, the A lender, which are the, the banks, the big financial institutions that we deal with, will get the best rates, you know, under 2%, all the features that you could prepay it and you increase your payment and all that stuff that you would want as, as a borrower. That's our ideal scenario. Now, if you are faced with a little bit of a challenge, whether or not it's, you know, pandemic driven or, or, or prices of homes, we do have, you know, B lenders and private money uh, that's available. But as we move down to the B lenders and private money, I'm going to say it's costing the clients more money, higher interest, maybe fees. I'm glad you mentioned that because I do think people do get kind of mis- uh, misunderstood of what kind of lenders they are. They think, oh, I'm getting money from a bank, but there are different types of financing. So I'm glad you touched on that. OK, so what if somebody's coming to you, Ray? Let's say, you know, Mr. Smith is been in Canada. He's been renting and he is excited to get his first property. He wants to get his first home. Maybe he has a baby on the way. I don't know. Maybe, you know, he's getting married. He just wants to get a house. Uh, he comes to you and says, Ray, you know, I've been looking at the areas and right now in the GTA, pretty much the starting price is a million dollars, right? So let's just use a million dollars. So he says, Ray, uh, I think I'm going to need a million dollars, but, you know, I am i don't think I'm going to get approved. You crunch the numbers. You see that he's not able to uh, get approved at that moment. Uh, what are some things that Mr. Smith and other clients like him can do to increase their ability to uh, afford uh, a million dollar mortgage or to increase the chances of them getting approved? Is there anything other than make more money? <laughs> Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's number one, right? So if, um, certainly there's a lot of things that affects uh, how much you can borrow, the income. So sometimes uh, some of the techniques that we've seen lately is that you know, certain families will look for properties that has secondary or third units, right? So you can increase your income. So make more money, yes, of course, uh, on a personal income level or business uh, income level. But that's one way when you have a secondary unit, it's one way to rent out the basement, get a few thousand dollars out of that one. And certainly that's additional income that we can use. Um, make sure that your credit history is impeccable. This is where you go, you know, you can get the best rates, you can get the best features of the mortgage if you have really good credit history. Because if you have bad credit history, even if your income is, I don't know, $500,000 a year, you can get you can, you cannot, you, it's very well possible that the banks will not lend you that money because of that credit history. So credit history is another. Um, there's a few other things, uh, paying down some of your existing debts. So if you have a lot of car loans and credit card balances and, and uh, line of credits and stuff, those will affect uh, your, your ability to borrow. So sometimes I'll, I'll tell my clients, say, hey, I mean, if you don't need a car today, you know, or you have your nice dependable Toyota, you know, bef- let's close the deal. Let's buy that home because that is an appreciating asset. And, and the benefits of home ownership is really there for you. And I want you to get it. Um, so maybe in a year or two, then you get your Mercedes Benz. <laughs> okay. That's good advice. I like that. So what if uh, somebody wants to come to you for a principal property or residence uh, versus a rental? Does that uh, play into a factor of what kind of mortgage they they can get and how much of a mortgage they can get? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, From a lender perspective, those are two different uses of a property. Um, It's it's two different risk levels as far as they're concerned. Um, so if you look at a home that I mean, is going to buy to move into, uh, that's your primary residence. That's where you're going to put your head down every night. Um, financial institutions when counted as a lesser risk compared to a rental property that, that somebody else is living in. So if you have your last thousand or last mortgage payment, or at least for the month or your mortgage payment for the month, you likely put that mortgage payment on your home that you're living in, as opposed to the home that somebody else is living in even though you own both. Um, so that's, that's one risk component of it, but there's also different uh, minimum down payment requirements. So the home that you're gonna live in, uh, the minimum down payment is 5% for the first $500,000 of the purchase price. And then after that, it's 10% up to a million, All right? So you can go high ratio, less than 20% down, minimum 5% if it's less than 500,000, anything over that, like I said, uh, the subsequent uh, anything over that will be 10%. A million dollars or over, 
it has to be at least 20%. Now, if I compare that minimum down payment from a primary resident to a rental property, the rental property, you can only get a minimum down payment of 20%. Sometimes it's more. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, that's interesting. But you were mentioning if somebody wants to, let's say, buy a home and the only way they can afford it is by having that income um, basement or uh, being able to uh, have roommates or whatever, is that something that is going to be an issue for them? No, as long as you move into one of the units. So if you have a fourplex or triplex and you're in one of the main units, Mm -hmm. you can get the uh, the rental income and still qualify under the high ratio or less than 20% down uh, scenario. Okay, that's good to know. That's really actually good to know. Right now, we know we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, About a million Canadians at least have lost their jobs. Um, So that means those million Canadians most likely have a mortgage or are hoping to buy something that they can uh, live in. Uh, What happens if somebody has uh, income interruption or they're on CERB or they're on EI? What happens then when they're trying to come to you and say, I need a mortgage? Now, you're right. It's unfortunate during the pandemic that we've seen a lot of people um, lost their jobs. And, and, and in fact, I have a few clients that we pre approved for that had to end up using their current savings that they were earmarked to buy something. Now they're starting over to save because they lost their job and they end up having to use it. CERB is obviously, it's a good uh, government grant uh, subsidy, uh, EI being obviously the other component of it. Um, if you need it, obviously take it. If you don't need it, obviously the idea behind it is you shouldn't be taking it. Now, from a financial standpoint, uh, when a financial institution basically, when we approach a financial institution today, they will always ask us how the pandemic has affected the client's income, always, 100% of the time. So if the client basically hasn't been affected because they continue working, because they get to work from home, great, not an issue. But you're, you're, what you mentioned there is the CERB. So if a client actually took CERB and let's say completed back in I don't know, 2020, September, and, and um, back to work today, not a big deal. If you're in a salary position, I can use that income annualized to, to use for your, for your mortgage approval. Now, if you're currently on EI or CERB, unfortunately, um, you're, you're basically attesting that, well, you know, you're, you've had enough on a, an income interruption that your income is not stable enough whether or not it's just reduced hours or less income or not working altogether, none of the financial institutions will approve it at this point. What about income interruption? Like uh, somebody is um, uh, suddenly pregnant and they have to take mat leave or parental leave. What about that? Does that, and then they have a mortgage coming up. Does that play a factor as well? Uh, not at all. So that income interruption is actually accounted for. So even before the pandemic, if you are on mat leave or paternity leave, as long as we can get a letter of employment from your current employer, that you have an anticipated return date and you've got a guaranteed income. So whether or not it's a salary position or, or a wage with a guaranteed number of hours, 100% of that income we can use to qualify. Okay. So are there any other scenarios um, where somebody is going to come to you thinking, oh, I have money coming from the government and I should be fine to get approval, but they actually will not get that approval or that money will not be taken into consideration? Is there anything else? That's a good question. Um, Short-term disability. Mm. So short-term disability is a scenario where um, a client may think that you know, the, the short-term disability uh, compensation is subsidizing part of their income, right? It, it, they're in addition to what they're currently earning. And they may think that, well, it's the same level of income because I'm doing, you know, I'm getting some level of uh, income from the government, but in all honesty, it's not income. That, that short-term disability is not something that we can count on for today moving forward because there's an end date to a short-term disability. Now, consequently, if it's a long-term disability, it's something that we would consider. Okay, really good information. Uh, Ray, that leads me to my next one. I know, like we've said, the pandemic has really changed things up for a lot of people, right? Um, It could be from their income. It could be from, let's say, they had rental properties and all of a sudden people are not paying the rent. So now they're carrying uh, those properties as well. Um, 
let's talk about refinancing your home because some people, the beauty of having your own property is not only are you uh, able to uh, pay your own mortgage and eventually own, but you are able to pull out that equity, right? That's what everyone is selling, the dream of being a homeowner. So uh, this is a scenario, I would think, a, a time when people would be like, hey, I've had this home. And the equity that I've built in it should be able to help me out in these dark times, right? So when you have a client coming to you, can you walk us through that? Should people be considering refinancing their home right now? And in what scenario should they be doing that? Um, refinancing is a good way to rebalance your debts. So if you go, you know what, Ray, I've got a property that's worth a million dollars. For the last little while, either because you got sick or extraordinary expenses or anything of that sort, um, let's say your mortgage amount is five hundred thousand. Yeah, you have accumulated maybe a car loan. You accumulated um, unsecured debts like credit cards or unsecured uh, line of credit or loan. Um, those ones are typically higher interest and higher monthly payment or biweekly payment. However, you have it set up. Now, if you use refinance or your home as a security with a mortgage, you actually get a lower rate because our rates right now are really, really good. And we can also expand the, uh, the payment schedule up to 30 years, right? So that's where you go. You win in terms of the interest rate is lower and you also win because you get to set a lower minimum payment. Now, setting the lower minimum payment doesn't mean that you can't pay it sooner, but it does give you more control on what's affordable today. And then maybe a month from now or two months from now, you, you, there's another interruption in income, you go or um, your expenses, go and bring it back down. So it is a good tool, refinance, to rebalance your debt. Now, you can use it for a lot of other things, such as you mentioned earlier, hey, you know, I've seen properties increase in value, and maybe you are, you're a believer that prices of homes in, in the long term may not be in the short term, but in the long term, increases in value. So if that's something that you believe in, you would go, okay, I'm in. It's probably a good idea. We can leverage your current equity in your home, and then you can reinvest that into other properties. Um, and then there's also a scenario where, you know, if you have a lot of debts, but at the same time, you also don't have the just-in-case funds. Guess what? You know, it's, it's usually not a good idea to look at debt when there's extraordinary expenses. But it's, this is a scenario where you go, well, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. You don't know what's going to happen. Maybe if you're going to go through rebalancing your credit, maybe we also want to take a little bit more for just in case funds. Now it opens up your scope to maybe start investing in stocks and mutual funds. And maybe again, it gives you a little bit of a head start to start saving more. So if we're able to lower your payment and you start a little bit of investment savings, the, the lower payment, you can start, you know, and say there's more affordability, I have more disposable income, they have more money to use you can start saving, right? So again, when it comes down to it, the refinance is good when you have uh, the components that the lenders use to approve. Now, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, you may have $500,000 worth of, of uh, equity in the home because your property is worth a million dollars. You have a mortgage of 500. If you've lost your job or you got sick, your income is not there. Uh, you, you've seen, you know, uh, that your credit history went, you know, went down because you had to use all this debt. Those are the worst times to, to, to look at borrowing. So when you have the income and you necessarily don't need it currently, you may want to, you know, put in the scenarios that you need just in case. So if you're desperate for the money because certain things have already happened because of your income, your credit history, those are the scenarios where you could say, hey, I need help for those scenarios. Unfortunately, you will be, you're going to be considered as a higher risk. Not that we can't find lenders for you. It's just that maybe that's when we move down to the B lenders and stuff. That's so interesting you say that because that's usually the times when people need the money. So that's when they're going to be considering refinancing. I can't imagine anyone's like, I've got lots of money coming in, but I'm going to refinance my mortgage. <laughs> I know. That's the irony of, of household finances, right? So when you think everything is going well, that's the perfect time to plan out what you're going to do, you know, whether or not, you know, adding some insurance, some, you know, just in case funds that we mentioned, planning for your current debt, what we're going to do, because you're employed, you've got everything is nice and, you know, nice and good and you're complete control and all the lenders love you right now. For the moment that you, yeah, when you lose your job and you've already accumulated so much debt that it affected your credit history, 
even though you have a, you know, I have a, you have a equity on your home. Sometimes those are the times that are a little bit more difficult to, to, to finance. I wasn't planning on asking this question, but when you were speaking, it just popped in my mind. I don't know if you saw this article about families that are coming together, pulling their money to buy properties. It's something that we normally don't hear about here. Maybe people will do it within their own family, but not go, hey, you might have a friend from school that's also looking for a home. You're like, we both can't afford it on our own, but let's come together and be able to buy it, right? And we can live together. That's what the article has. The families were living together, but sharing one mortgage. So in that scenario, if that's something we're going to start seeing as a trend, uh, what would you do if a client came to you and said, I want to get a mortgage like this? I would, I would actually applaud them because they're being creative with it, right? So, I mean, the reality is, you know, I'm a big proponent of, of home ownership. And however, however you get to it, just get on that train, right? Get that home ownership because it is, you know, it is an appreciating asset. So what you can buy for $500,000 today, if you're thinking I'm going to save to get 20% down payment, if it takes you two years to save 20% down payment, that 500,000 two years from now is not the same property. Now, if you go, Hey, you know, I've got uh, my, my friend from university or my cousin, they look like they're all looking to buy as well, but they just don't have enough. This is where we go because of the higher stress test or, you know, they don't just don't have enough income right now or somebody doesn't have the down payment or at least the full amount of the down payment. If you pool your resources and you get to go and buy in 2021, you probably have more options two years from now, three years from now when the property has increased in value and maybe your income um, has some, you know, your individual household income technically has have increased. Then you can look at, you know, um, maybe a removal of covenant where you go either sell the place and buy another place, right? And, and two separate ones, or you get to buy out the one family and the other, other family uses that money that you bought out from, or they use the money to, to, to get bought out and buy another property. Um, I do tell them to make sure that they get legal advice because you, you need to understand what the parameters are of, of that union, of that agreement, right? So if you go, okay, well, do we have an exit strategy, right? Can you really afford this house for a million dollars in thinking that two years from now, it's going to be worth more? It could be worth more, but if you can't afford that mortgage for $800,000, well, you're not going to be able to buy out somebody. So usually we, we look at, again, the legal components of it, how we're going to register it, and then really the exit strategy on how, okay, I'm in, you're, you want this million dollar property, can you get a mortgage for $800,000 in two years? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's basically like a joint venture. So uh, if somebody were to approach you with that, you're not going to be yeah. like, oh, I wouldn't touch that. It's totally fine, but just you need those extra components with it. Yeah. Very cool. And you're right. It's 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 kind of like a yeah, kind of like getting into a joint uh, joint venture, like you said, because like I said it's great going in, but you also need to know how it's going to work within the timeline that you're living there. So who's paying for what expense, and then uh, and then obviously how what's the exit strategy? Because you, I'm assuming you're not planning to live together for the next thirty years, um, but it is actually something that's happening now. Yeah. But I just want to make sure people understand that although it's a great idea, always have a contract, like just have something so that these deals could go wrong quickly, especially if, you know, one family decides they want to leave, the other family doesn't want to, maybe they don't want to sell, they want to hold on to it. So always get everything in a, in a contract. Okay, Ray, we're almost out of time, but uh, one last question. So obviously, uh, 2020, I remember everyone was like, oh, the real estate market's going to take a hit. Clearly, that didn't happen. Where in 2021 now, the market just seems to be hot, hot, hot with no end in sight. Um, so we're starting to hear some rumors that the government may um, try to do something, right? Um, uh, I've been hearing things about maybe interest rates going up. So far, we haven't seen anything or heard an announcement. Um, I know previously when the government uh, became involved in 2017 with the stress test, um, that did impact the way people were buying. I remember everyone was trying to run to con the condo market, and the condo market that year was just a, the, the best year they've ever had. So yeah. uh, I'm sure in the industry, you, you are prepared that if you hear of anything, that these things would affect your clients. So what trends or what um, policies do you think could happen that would affect a person's ability to be able to get a mortgage or the amount that they would be approved for? 
the government has a lot of power in terms of what they can do to to you know stimulate the economy or or slow it down, right? So uh, one of the easy things is is obviously the interest rate, the uh, overnight lending rate, which they actually announced uh, uh, not too long ago, uh, March tenth, and uh, the Bank of Canada decided that they're going to keep it. Now there's been some talks on you know will they increase the minimum down payment? Will they increase or lower the stress test? So those are certainly uh, avenues that they can uh, they can they can pull to to um, either again slow down the the real estate market. But in the middle of a pandemic, according to the Bank of Canada, it's not something that they're looking at doing right now. Maybe not until 2023. Now 2023 is still two years from now. There have been uh, bank economists that 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 are kind of saying hey, you that might be a little bit sooner than 2023 either end of 2022 or there's some that maybe that are saying maybe even sooner than that because we see such a hot real estate market now as much as we are kind of focused on the mortgage and real estate market today we're in the middle of a pandemic you know we're not the only industry that that uh that's operating in the canadian economy we, you know we've got you know we've got the tourism We've got the service industries. We've got so many more industries that that's technically still uh, are are not where they need to be. So I think if there is an increase and we see some you know some uh, some stimulus to either increase it or decrease it, we all they always look at the interest rate. They always look at you know size of down payment. They look at the stress test. You know there's a lot of things that they could do. But again, where we are today, I, I think you know. Real estate is still going to be quite hot in the middle of a pandemic. I think moving forward, like I said, I, I don't think we're going to see big jumps of interest. Uh, I think if there is maybe slow increase, um, I'm not really sure if I answered your question there, but I think when it comes down to it, um, price of homes will continue to go up, maybe not as high uh, of a rate that we have right now. Uh, maybe interest rate is one of the ways for them to do it. There's been there's been articles, I think, not too long ago that's comparing Canadian housing market to New Zealand and what New Zealand has done to, to kind of slow down their real estate uh, market, which is increasing down payment uh, requirement for primary residences and, and rentals. Technically, Canada could do that. I don't think they would, um, but it's technically uh, something that they could do. Okay, so you don't see anything coming up this year that would really affect your clients? Not necessarily. Maybe... So the, the, the struggle right now is our first time home buyers, right? The struggle right now is that we want to support the first time home buyers because it is a good goal to be, you know, to get into home ownership. Um, but there's also that component where if we increase the stress test, we increase the minimum down payment, we shorten the amortization and stuff, they're going to get affected. So they're less likely to, to be able to get into home ownership and, I mean, a lot of the first-time home buyers are millennials, and there's a lot of millennials out there. So you can't just, you know, ignore their struggle to become homeowners because at some point, you know, people that are homeowners right now, at some point they have to sell it and downsize, which is national life cycle. Um, I would say it's it it is a concern. It is something that we're actually looking to support in terms of home ownership to the first-time home buyers. It's just that the market is just too hot. Prices are too high. Okay, interesting. Thank you so much for all your insight. Thank you so much, Amin. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to see more episodes like this, please do subscribe to this channel and also be sure to give this video a big like and share it with anyone that you know would be interested in hearing more about mortgages. Also be sure to check out some of my past interviews over here and here so you don't miss a thing. Thanks so much again for watching. I'll see you again in my next video.